Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon and welcome here in the Blaue Zaal. Welcome to this Studium Generale lecture, uh, Beyond Male and Female. Um, we're going to talk, be talking today about gender, which may sound at first sight like a clear concept, but as you dive into it, it gets more and more complex. You've got gender diversity, gender identity, gender expression, so lots of things to discuss today. Let me first say that this lecture is being recorded, as you can see, uh, but we are not filming you as an audience. You are not visible in this video. You might be audible if you ask a question, so please be aware of that. Um, today is not only this lecture, but also the opening of an exhibition in Atlas on transgender history in the Netherlands. Uh, it's an exhibition that we are organizing at Studium Generale together with COMPAS, the LGBTQ plus community here at the TUE. Uh, and um, this uh, uh, exhibition um, shows the extraordinary history from the early pioneers of the 50s all the way to today's youngest generation of influencers. And it really demonstrates that uh, expressions of gender and sexuality that go beyond male and female are in fact not new. They've been around for a while, they've been around for decades, um, but it's also clear that we are talking about it more and more. One of the results of this is, for example, on Facebook, I know none of us are using it anymore, but on Facebook you can choose from over 50 genders now. Uh, and I was just curious to see what kind of genders come to mind when you hear something like that. You can just shout it out if you like. What genders would you pick? Oh, no, would you pick? But could you choose from on Facebook? Non-binary? Non -binary? Yeah, you can also say male and female. Eh? Let's start easy. <laughs> so we've got male, male, female, non-binary. Anything else? A gender? Who offers more? No. Trans mask? Trans mask? Yeah. yeah. I mean, they're over 50, so none of them are wrong, probably. Yeah, yeah. yeah. lots of, of combinations, you're right, yeah. Well, as you can see, a lot of variation uh, and also maybe some unclarity on what gender actually is. Uh, and that's what we'll be hearing more uh, about today from Mark Hommes, uh, who is a psychologist from the Open University. He's a, an associate professor at the Department of Clinical Psychology. Uh, in his uh, daily work, his research, he focuses on uh, self-stigma and stigma coping and well-being among transgender people and their families. Uh, and he will not only discuss today the major role gender plays in our lives, uh, but he will also, in particular, illustrate how people are affected when they don't fit into the usual boxes that we assign to gender. So please welcome Mark Holmes. Thank you. Thank you very much. What a wonderful audience. It's a, it's a huge uh, place here. I'm very pleased to uh, be talking to you about gender today. And I would like to, um, to start at the beginning. And I mean really the beginning, your beginning. Because I would like you to think back to the moment that your parents first noticed that you were on your way. Ah, baby's coming. What do you think was the first thing that they were curious about? The sex, yes, of course, it is something like this. Because a baby's... When we know that a baby is going to be born, when there's a new person in the world, it is the first thing that we want to know. And if we don't have that information, we can, we can't, we can hardly think of what name it will have, we can hardly think of how to address it. Uh, knowing a person's sex makes us follow a whole line of expectations about this person that's going to come. Our gender roles. And it's a bit weird, isn't it? I mean, why are these roles so fixed? Because if you look nowadays in our society, what really essential differences are there in opportunities for boys and girls? You can become almost every uh, a job, you can get every, any job you want. What, what real differences are there between men that are so essential, that is, uh, it is, must be our fundamental uh, category in categorizing people? It's a bit weird, but it's cultural. It's been like this for, for many ages. And before I clarify gender diversity, I must first 
untangle a few concepts here, because they are often uh, taken together. Now, let's start with the biological sex. You know, when you were born as the baby, first thing they looked between the legs, and if there was a penis, then you were a boy, and if there was uh, a vagina, you were probably a girl. So, um, that's what we call our biological sex. And the categories are very often female or male, but mind you, there are people who are being born with the sex, uh, bio biological, uh, 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 what do you say, um, things <laughs> of, <laughs> of, of both sexes. So that's the intersex condition. Now, a very important other one here today is our gender identity. And by gender identity, we mean the deep felt sense of being boy or being girl, or being neither, or being both, being something in between. As you see, all these categories are uh, continua. So you can either feel completely a woman, you can feel that you're completely a man, but you can feel anything in between, and we'll be talking about that later. Now, the other one is gender expression, and by that we mean how you dress, how you wear your hair, how you behave, according to the gender roles that we know in our society. So you can either present yourself very feminine, very masculine, or anywhere in between, and that's what we call androgynous. And then there is a fourth, and that is our sexual orientation. I have to say that really has nothing to do with gender diversity. Uh, sexual orientation is about the people you fall in love with, the people you have romantic feelings about. Sometimes people think that has very, very much to do with gender identity or uh, gender uh, diversity, but it doesn't really. So, if we look at the words, the, the terminology that we use for different diverse genders, the first one I want to mention is, is cisgender. And how many of you are aware of the meaning of the word cisgender? Yeah, that's quite a few, very good. Because cisgender is the name, a cisgender person is a person with whom the biological sex at birth is the same as the gender identity. So it's the majority of people in our country are called cisgender. Then we have a diversity concerning the gender expression. There are people who very much like to express themselves in the clothing, uh, the, 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 the appearance of the gender that they were not born in. Cross-dressers and transvestites is that category. And there is a category of people who vary in their gender identity. If your gender identity doesn't fit your biological sex, that is when we call people transgender. And there are, you heard it, there were 50, there are so many different categories of transgender groups, but I have just a few here for you. Um, the first one is, um, if, you, if your gender identity is completely opposite to your biological sex, we call you uh, a trans man if you were born a woman, FTM stands for fe female to male, and a trans woman if you are born as a man, male to female. So that's people, mostly the people who want to change their appearance, change their body to, for it to uh, comply with their uh, gender identity. And then there are two categories of people who do not feel completely man and not feel completely woman. The non-binary, we heard it uh, uh, in, the, in the audience already. Non-binary stands for people who don't, do not feel at home at the gender identity of men and neither at gender identity of women, but they might feel somewhere in between, or they might feel that they are both, or they might feel that they are neither. And gender fluid is what we use for when people feel, you know, one day I feel more like a man, and another day I feel somewhere in between, and then another day I might feel a woman. If it's fluid, we call it gender fluid. And what we see today is that people sort of... Uh, find ways to, to define themselves, to define their identity in so many ways that Facebook has 50 to choose from. And then you have the matter of how to address people. You know, if somebody is a man, you just say he, and if somebody is a woman, you say she. The non-binary and the gender fluid categories don't fit in either. So the pronouns that we use for people, uh, non-binary or gender fluid, is they, them, and their. And then it's in... It's not in plural, 
it's just one person, so you say, uh, they goes to the shop, for instance. Okay, now, Alex Bakker has this wonderful exhibition that you can visit later on. Um, and that goes, that, that's about the history in Holland uh, for the last uh, 70 years or so. But, you know, transgender people have been reported throughout history. Uh, I just have a few, I can't, I can't address them all, but do you know that in the Copper Age, 5,000 years ago, people had very distinct burial rites. If you were a woman, you were buried on your left side with all your pottery in the grave, and if you were, born, if you were a man, you were born on your right side with all your weapons in your grave. So, a few years ago, they found this grave from that era, and they clearly thought, okay, this must be a woman. But what was the surprise when they found out, when they examined the body, that this had been physically a man. So we don't know what exactly happened to this person and why he or she, whichever pronoun she would have preferred, was buried in that grave that way. But, you know, there have been examples for ages. There have been Roman emperors. We've had a, a pope who appeared as a man but finally appeared to be a woman, Joan of Arc. Uh, and some, sometimes people say, yeah, you know, these, these women, that's not really gender identity. Um, it's, it's a logical thing. In those days, as a woman, you could never become uh, a priest. You could never become a cardinal or a pope. So maybe it just had something to do with the gen taking the gender roles and the gender appearance in order to be able to, um, to, to do things that you weren't allowed to do. But I have this one example, Christina I of Sweden. And, Christina was the heir to the Swedish throne. Um, she was very tomboy-like, you know. She, was, she, she f played like a boy and she preferred to dress like a boy. And that was okay when she was the crown princess, but once she was 18, her father died young, she had to get on the throne and she had to be the queen. And, you know, she had to behave like a queen and to dress like a queen. And Christina felt so much not at home in this, that she, after two years, she decided to abdicate. She left the throne to her nephew. She went to travel through Europe, dressed as a man, and finally, uh, she, she went to Italy to live with her, uh, to her beloved wife, with her beloved uh, girlfriend. And I say she, but I should probably be saying he to, her, to Christina, because I think that's what she, he would have preferred. So, you know, there have numerous examples. It's always been there. But we see a rise in numbers lately. Um, how many are we talking about? In 2012, there was a, a study under the general population, and people were asked about their birth, sex, and their gender identity. And 1% of them reported that they had uh, a cross-gender identity, so born as a man, feeling a female, and the other way around. Another 4% had an ambiguous gender identity, meaning that their gender identity was closer to the opposite sex. And the wish for adjustments to their body uh, to make it uh, more like their uh, gender identity was 0.4%. But the funny thing was that the number of people in those days that went to the gender clinics were by far not as high as these numbers. Year, each year there were about 250 people who went for a gender-affirming treatment. And that's what, you know, the sex change operations, a treatment where people uh, are, are treated with hormones and um, uh, op operations to make their appearance more like their gender identity. So there was a big gap. It was sort of a tip of the iceberg. Well, the iceberg has come up because since, I think maybe since 2010, the numbers of people that went to the gender clinics for treatment rose and rose and rose. And this year, there are about 5,000, almost 5,000 people seeking, uh, getting help for uh, gender-affirming treatment. And we can't help them all, because the waiting list at this point is about 6,000 uh, 6, to 7,000 people. So what we see is a tremendous increase, and it's still going on. Each year there is about 20%, 30% more question for this uh, treatment than the year before. So that's a very strange thing. How come that there are so many people nowadays wanting to change their gender, their sex? Well, 
we think mainly this has to do with social cultural influences. Um, there are a few, we don't know exactly, but there are a few uh, things that, that uh, work in here. And that is, on the one thing, social media. Social media and the internet make it far more easy for people to get access to information, to get access to contacts with other people who feel the same thing. The other thing is that transgender people are far more visible in the media than they were, say, 10 years ago. Uh, programs like Hey is and say, he is a she, programs on, tel programs on television, uh, magazines, interviews. Transgender people have role models now. And the other thing is that the transgender healthcare is now more open for non-binary people as well. You know, in the old days, about 12 years ago, if you wanted a sex uh, change operation, a, a, a gender affirming treatment, then you had to be sure that you wanted to go all the way. If you were born a woman, you had to be you want, had to want to become completely man and the other way around. And nowadays, the gender clinics see that um, sometimes people just want to, to adjust part of their being. And especially that non-binary group that I was talking about, they, they do not wish, wish to uh, change their body completely. Maybe just uh, lose the breasts or just um, take hormones. So, this is probably what, uh, uh, what explains the increase that we see now. So it's, it's a very cultural phenomenon. The number of people that come out as transgender is a very cultural phenomenon. But it's not just culture. I mean, people don't become uh, transgender because, because of the culture. So what do we know about uh, the reasons behind that? Well, what we do know and this research is, is recent, about 10, 20 years, is that there is a strong genetic influence. Looking at twin studies, identical twins and non-identical twins, we see, see that um, the gender identity problems are f f partly uh, genetic. And they're partly hormones, hormonal as well. Um, the sexual differentiation hypothesis is... Uh, a hypothesis that states that during the first three months of that pregnancy, uh, the organs are formed. And during the last three months of the pregnancy, uh, your, your brain is formed and it's more crystallized. And if something happens between these uh, situations, maybe influenced by genetics uh, that were there, and probably having to do with hormones, then you can be, become more likely to get... Uh, transgender identity later on. And if you look at, um, at the brains of people, we, we now have all these techniques where we can look at uh, functioning of the brains and, and the shape of the brains, then we see that the brains of transgender uh, people often correspond more with the preferred gender than with the gender that they were born in. And they do that before they start taking hormones. So there is definitely a biological basis to transgender feelings. And of course, there is also the psychology. So, gender identity is a very complex thing that we build up gradually in our lives. And we, we uh, have all sorts of situations that we come into, we draw our conclusions for that, we have our feelings with that. So, it's a very complex interaction between the environment and the personal factors that, in the end, define your gender identity. So, if you look, what, what causes the gender identity? Well, we don't know exactly. It's a very complex interaction between several partly unknown uh, variables, biological and psychosociological. But I would like to stress, it's not just a choice. It's not just, a, oh, you know, I, I'll, I'll become transgender, it's fashion now. It isn't. And it's also nobody's fault. It's not always the mother who did it. But what if, what if you have what if the box doesn't fit? What if you find yourself, after a few years, in the box of a certain gender, and you don't, just, just, just don't fit? Well, I brought a case here with me. Um, what do you think? Is this a boy or a girl? Anyone? Difficult to see, boy? Boyish, okay. Well, it's difficult to see, so I'll, I'll fast forward for a few years. This is the same person. Girl, yeah. 
The breasts give it away, don't they? The breasts give it away. And I hated those breasts. Because all the girls in my class, they, they liked it when the breasts began to show. But it was terrible for me. It's me here on this photo. I didn't, I didn't feel a girl. And I felt awful. And I can assure you that growing up with a transgender identity is one hell of a challenge. It's very difficult, because you can imagine that the alienation and the confusion that there is. Because you live in a world where everybody sees you as a girl, for instance. But I didn't. I wasn't. So it was an alienation from the world in the one part. People, people don't see me as I am. But it was an alienation from myself as well. Feeling, you know, I, there's something wrong with me. I'm not... Why am I... Why am I a girl, and why am I not uh, in, uh, capable of just living like a girl? So you can imagine that um, that causes a lot of problem. And then there is, I mean, this is the, the first one was the inside struggle, but there's also the outside struggle because of the stigma that rests on people who step out of uh, the gender box that the, they should belong in. Stigma is the negative ideas that people have about, say, transgender or um, um, uh, any group of people that they have negative ideas about. And the trouble with stigma is that it can get internalized. And that means that the negative views that people have on your group, you internalize them and you think, OK, they're right. And it sort of spreads like an, like an ink blot, because what you feel is negative about yourself, it makes you ashamed, maybe. Uh, your shame causes withdrawal from social situations. You don't, don't go to situations where you expect people to be negative about you. It causes loneliness, um, and it might cause less education. It didn't in my case, but uh, what you see is people are not comfortable in their lives, and people are, is, is that they sort of don't get to what they could have got if they, if they were feeling okay. So if you look at Dutch transgenders, we see that their education level overall is lower than the general population. Uh, poverty, the, the, the amount of money that they have is less than the general population. And it, it can even cause health problems, you know. The stress that it gives can cause health problems. And the problems that we see in the group of transgender people is, is huge. About 50% of transgender people in the Netherlands uh, state that they have some psychological problems. Depression is most common. Anxiety also. And um, the most shocking figures for myself, I think, are always the suicide. Uh, the suicidal ideation, for instance, that is thinking about suicide, contemplating suicide. If you look, 96%, that is three out of, no, two out of three, two thirds of the Dutch transgenders um, have ever considered suicide. I have, when I was about 20, and I didn't know what to do with myself anymore. And then the suicide attempts, it's 10 times higher as the general population. And also, even during and after treatment, the actual amount of deaths by suicide was 0.04%, and that is also higher than the general population. So, it is a group that has very much problems psychologically and very many difficulties. Now, what helps then, in that case? Um, for years, in the last century, people thought that you could Therapy, if you gave therapy, then a gender identity could change. People could overcome their general, uh, gender problems. But they can't. It's, uh, research shows that this is not helping. What, do, what does help is the gender-affirming treatment. Uh, for instance, the treatment that I, uh, I discussed earlier for taking hormones and then operations. That's the treatment that's generally advised for people who feel very strongly uh, about their gender identity not fitting. And then we, what we see is that the, the amount of problems really go, goes down for people after they've had this treatment. So, in a way, it is helping if you get at the end of the waiting list and if you get, uh, if you get the treatment. 
And also, of course, reducing self-stigma would help. Stigma and self-stigma would help a lot. So what happened to this case? Um, yeah, I struggled for my, all of my puberty. At the age of 20, I sort of decided, you know, it's just roles, it's just gender roles. Let's skip the roles. I will live, I, I don't have to live as a, the way a woman should live. I'll just live my own life and it'll be okay. So I did, and that helped a lot. I, uh, I married, I, I fancy boys. I married, we got a son, and life was rather okay, but there was all the time there was something not in order. I always felt that there was something not right, and it kept coming up, problems kept coming up. And at the age of almost 50, I decided to uh, do, the, uh, do, the, do the, uh, the treatment. So I got hormones, and I got operations, and now I live happily ever after, I hope. <laughs> and you know, the son on my, uh, on my back, he is uh, 27 years old now, and he still calls me mummy. I told him, you can call me anything you like, and he preferred to call me mummy. And, I, and we sort of liked that. When we, were, when we went to shops and people, you know, you, you can imagine the situation in a restaurant or in the train, and he's saying, Mom, can I have this? I say, yeah, okay, and then people go. We sort of liked this situation so that if people were really interested, we could tell them about it. Um, but this is my story, and this is um, what I wanted to tell you. So, are there any questions? And I believe we have a special boy here who throws the microphone. We have a catch box as well, yeah. yeah. So uh, in a minute, if you have any questions, you can think about it already. I was curious to hear, Mark, um, how has um, your personal experience helped you in your professional life? It helps me a lot. I work together with uh, uh, Arjan Boss, Professor Arjan Boss, and we do the research together. And it helps me to find sometimes a deeper layer in the data, you know, when, when um, we do a lot of... Uh, qualitative studies, and we get the data, and it sometimes appears very clear, but because I have my own experience, and because many of my friends are transgender as well, I sort of sometimes feel, oh yeah, but we should look a bit deeper, a bit further. And I'm very happy that I work together with Aryan, because he is, I, 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 might get, I might get biased, you know, by my own mm -hmm. uh, situation, but because we do it together, and I, we, I do it with my colleague Saskia as well, she was here, uh, as well. Um, so I think it's, it's helped to do the research. Yeah. yeah. More em empathic, perhaps, as well. Or yeah, more empathic and more, and more uh, capable of seeing the layers beneath and what is more subtle. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks. Welcome to the room. Are there any questions already for Mark? Anything you'd like to hear more about? I see one hand up there. No, 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 we will have the catch box for you, because <laughs> we're in a big room. You have to catch, yeah. Go um, ahead. Yeah, on the black uh, spot, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think the obvious question was your first given name. It was Mark, right? Yeah. What was it? Sorry? What was your first given name? Oh, my first, first name. name. Yeah, yeah th you know, that's a question you shouldn't really be asking a transgender <laughs> person, but I don't mind. Uh, but I, I just name it so that, because transgender persons very often feel not very happy about their past. My first name was Marion, Marion. So I, I, I really don't mind it, but try not to ask the question to general transgenders. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, I see a question up here, if you can throw it to the front. Uh, how, did you, how did you choose your name? Yeah, um, well, I had, a, I had a different, I was called, I called myself David at first. You know, throughout my life, I sort of fantasized that I, I was a boy, that I had a boy's life as well. And then I was David, I like that name. But the funny thing was that I have this thesis and I have some articles and they're all M.H. Homus. And I thought, well, if, I, if I'm David, it, it doesn't fit into the initials anymore. So I, I thought of Mark. It's a very pragmatic consideration yeah. <laughs> there as so well. Yeah. <laughs> I like sense. Mark as well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, moving to the left for me. 
Yeah, I think maybe I've missed it, but um, did you? What is your research actually about? And you said you transitioned later in life. Mm -hmm. um, what was your research about the same topic before that? No, it wasn't. No, no, no. Um, no, my research is about um, well-being of transgender people, and I look especially at stigma and self-stigma and coping styles that people have to cope with that stigma. And uh, no, I, I, in the old days, I did different research, and I was fed up with that. And by the time I did my transition, uh, uh, the colleague that I work with now uh, came to me and said, isn't, well, he was doing research on stigma, and he said, isn't this a, an interesting topic for transgenders? And I thought, yeah, it is. So. Okay. Anyone on that side who has a question or comment? Yeah, I see two. If we move to the back first, watch out for the cameras. Yeah, <laughs> nice. In the back first, or or was I in the back? I okay. saw one hand. I don't know who it okay. was. Yeah, that was me. Yeah, uh, go ahead. So, uh, uh, from what I can find, a lot of the a lot of uh, transgender-focused research is focused on gender dysphoria and the treatment of it. And with that, uh, the uh, concept of gender euphoria is often seen as a sort of opposite of that. Uh, is there any research really focused on just uh, the idea of gender euphoria as a separate thing. I don't know. But can can you maybe uh, explain a little bit about gender euphoria is the term you use? Yeah, gender dysphoria is the, the word that we use in the DSM uh, category for people who are very unhappy with their gender and who would like a, uh, a treatment for that. Uh, and gender euphoria, of course, is the opposite. Um, and I think it's a very interesting topic, but I'm, I'm not aware of uh, studies that have been done on that. Uh, yeah, and, and I've, I've experienced it myself, that the moment you decide and you really uh, are able to transition to the body that fits your gender identity, it, it's a huge uh, euphoria that comes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I can imagine that's also something, of course, when you look at this discussion in the news, the focus is often on the negative side and how it negatively impacts uh, transgender people. Mm -hmm. um, should there be like a celebration day as well, or uh... yeah, that would be great. <laughs> but then Is there are so many categories yeah. of, of trans. That, you know, the, in the month of June, that it's always the Pride Month, and in the Pride Month, you can hang a different flag uh, every day for a different category, and there are numerous flags for the transgender category as well. So maybe we should celebrate the whole life. And We've seen the addition days. of the transgender symbol in the in the LGBT flag, I think, in recent years. Yeah. Um, you, you've, we've discussed before that um, um, you're also not really in favor of all these boxes or of being put in boxes. Can you say a little bit about that? Because, of course, in the discussion about transgender, it's still fairly binary. It's uh, male to female or female to male. Mm -hmm. um, you also mentioned there's a whole group of people who are non-binary or fluid. Um, yeah. Should, do we need more boxes like yeah, Facebook yeah, or do we need yeah, a different yeah. discussion? No, I, I, I think it's very beautiful that people find out that they don't want to be in the strict boxes of, of men and women. And uh, I, we shouldn't be going to more boxes, of course, but it's, it's a sort of a, a phase in between, I think. And, uh, Where will it lead to? I hope it would lead to letting go of the gender roles and the, the strictness of that. And um, the idea that your biological sex does not determine um, the way you should behave, the way you should dress. And in a way it doesn't, but it, well, that, that's an interesting question because I think in a way um, gender dysphoria has to do with the roles that we have, the gender roles mm -hmm. with society, but it, it's, there's also something physical about it. So when I was 20 I decided to skip the roles and to leave them behind, but that wasn't really the trick. The trick was for me to really be seen as a man. So. so the problem was more the way society viewed you than how you felt yourself? Yeah. It was both, okay. actually. I thought first it was only the way society viewed me. And if I let, let go of the, 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 the roles, then it would be okay. But that wasn't enough. Yeah. It's also about how you feel yourself and how your body combines with how you feel. Yeah. Okay, thanks. There was a question up here as well. If you could throw... Okay, yeah, we move to the front and then we move back to you. <laughs> so, 
thank you. Um, yeah, I'm still a bit, um, I, I'm still trying to, to, to make it a good question. Um, <laughs> now, I have a brother and he has Kleinfelter. <laughs> you know that, uh, you know about that. Um, he's like two meters tall almost. He's really a huge guy. Mm -hmm. uh, but he uses avatars and they're like little, like small elves. He feels like a small girl, and of course he looks like a really huge guy. Mm -hmm. And yeah, like in my youth, I always used to tease him a bit about that, so I feel really guilty right mm -hmm. now. <laughs> but how could, how, how could I help him or other people who, are, who have such a big like, difference between how they feel mm -hmm. and how they look? Yeah, acceptance, I think, is the word yeah. that comes to mind. And he, what he feels is what he is. And yeah. he is maybe a very large elf. That could be <laughs> the case as well, couldn't it? Yeah, I think so. So I think acceptance is the key word. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. There was a question back. Yeah, back there Whoa, with the waving person. That's a difficult throw. Sverre, uh, can you? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, on the topic of... Can you hold it a bit closer? I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 On the topic of gender roles, I think now, as a society, at least with my interpretation from social media, we're really moving to reject them quite strongly, at least. Mm -hmm. A lot of the... At least in the media as well. But from what I'm hearing, it's not so straight, black and white, that gender roles... How, like... How do you think we should approach the concept of discarding or not discarding generals? Because when you decided to transition, you wanted to fit a different yeah. gender role. I, I dress like a man again, yeah. yeah. Not I, I to, fit in a box. Again. Not to yeah. get rid of them completely. Mm. So how harmful, how do we approach the harm that they do but still maintain what they give to our society? Yeah, freedom, I think. Um, acceptance of any gender expression that people have. My gender expression is male. I like that now. Uh, and not always, I, I sometimes... But I, I, just because, maybe specifically because I couldn't really dress as a male, I like to do it now. Um, but I, I think the problem starts when... Um, there wouldn't be a problem if you accepted them all. And it's a very good thing now that, that there is more awareness of these sex roles and the impact that they have and how strict they are. We weren't aware of, of them. Most people aren't aware of them still, maybe. But I think it's good that people get aware of them and then feel free to move in whatever way they like within it. Okay, thank you. Okay, then we move to the final question up front. If you can throw it all the way to this side again. You can do it in parts. Let's work together. Yeah. Let's <laughs> do the front there, yeah. Yes. Um, okay, so I kind of want to add on to the question that was asked because I am a trans guy. I took my first dose of testosterone today, so yay me. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you. Um, but for me, like when I first started coming out as a guy to friends, I felt very much the need to be seen as a manly man. So I only wore jeans and sweaters, very boring. Um, <laughs> but since finding a community and friend group that really accept me as a man, no matter how I dress or act, I've started also um, letting go of the expected masculinity of being a trans man and just expressing myself as a man who happens to be trans. So I think that even though for some people it um, gives the safety net of being very masculine or very feminine, um, when you are in a situation where you feel safe and supported, the need for that might also slip away for some people who don't really need or want to express themselves hyper-masculine or hyper-feminine. Yeah, yeah, so it's exploring those stereotypes at the same time as your personal transition. Yeah. 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 
Yeah. <laughs> That's like, what good, I wanted to say. Good, yeah. <laughs> good for you, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, thank you. Uh, because of the time, we, we have to wrap up for now. So, Mark, thanks again for sharing your insights and story with us today. Mark Holmes. Thank you. Thank you for joining, for participating. Of course, go and visit this exhibition in Atlas. It's really very interesting. We hope to see you again uh, next week at Sirme Generale. 